As a young man, myself and a couple of friends used to meet up in Stourbridge once every few months and take it in turns to whisk the other two off to a destination in the British Isles. The idea being that they didn't know where they were going until they stepped out of the train at the end. The usual kinds of things that young men do ensued and of course it became more overblown until it gradually fell apart. But I have very fond memories of those days and also a little longing for all of the towns that we didn't visit and some towns more than others evoke that. Wellington's one of them. It's only a few weeks ago that I woke from the anaesthetic to the psychedelic hospital slideshow of two episodes of Secret Army, Goodbye Mr Chips, Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid, and then the pièce de résistance, Open All Hours, Ronnie Barker sweating at the sight of Linda Barron's legs. And here I am, back in the leaf-dappled sunlight of a July afternoon. Architectural anachronisms, the sweep of the town square, and the cosy trundle of the mobility scooter on municipal concrete. It's good to be back. You get a lovely sense of the town's history viewed from this point. All of its important moments visually signposted. From the doomsday village around the green and the church down to the new medieval charter that created the new marketplace and then the sudden startling arrival of the railways bisecting the town and propelling us forward into Victoriana and beyond. Tuscan pilasters, finials, friezes, cornices and architrave. All Saints is so easily associative with its Shropshire neighbours. Whitchurch, Shrewsbury, Bridge North. If I lived round here, I'd be tempted to vandalise those trees over there. I'm not a vandal and I like trees, I hasten to point out. But you know that anachronistic story about the bloke who gets his walking stick shaved incrementally smaller every day until eventually he doesn't notice that it's, it's shrunk to that size. I'd like to do the same sort of thing with the trees, possibly with a pair of nail scissors or nail clippers or something, and just every day walk past and snip a little bit off until eventually they were completely eroded. The reason being, when you come in to Wellington on the train, you can nearly see the church smacking you visually, beautifully, but the trees are in the way. So, just by way of incremental, gentle, urban, ecclesiastic, visual vandalism, which in itself might start off a thing, or might not. Yeah, might not. Oh, 
What's up, Dan? Are you wound playing up again? No, I'm having an evocation overload, if you must know. What are you on about now? The Corbett Monument. Look how evocative it is. It makes me feel like David Bowie in the video for Rubber Band. It's all sort of lichen encrusted, rust encrusted fleur de lis, mournfully leaning Art Nouveau angels, peeling paint, spider web, dead buddlia, and the reeking peeping its shoulder over the corner of the whole thing. Do you know what? If it had been me instead of Jodie Whittaker, that would be my TARDIS. In much the same way as the architectural vandalism that took place at Burford Church in the Cotswolds inspired William Morris to found the Society for the Preservation of Ancient Buildings, the building behind me that now houses Kip Abbey and the horrific architectural dismemberment that took place therein inspired the creation of the Wellington Civic Society. I'm going to Kip Abbey, Harris. I find it difficult to take threats seriously from a man wearing that tie. I wonder if those deep and static creamy cornflower blue skies, blue midland skies that rise atop the reeking and the rooftops are as stirringly exotic to the residents of Albuquerque as those deep purple and orange desert twilights that skid past the camera and the RV on Breaking Bad. I think they probably are. It's a lovely run of buildings along this street, beginning with the workhouse, sweeping past the Edwardian facade, along to the old library, and then, in his own words, the split level and splendid extension to the new library that was opened by Philip Larkin in 1962. There's been a lot of stuff written about Larkin and his relationship with Wellington, but it all fades in the glare of the words on the page. My mind has been defaulting to Larkin speak ever since I first saw him gazing out of George Macbeth's book on contemporary poetry in his pale tie and pale shirt and dark suit and sardonic deprecating eyes glaring straight at me. So many little phrases, bright knots of rail, a hothouse flashed uniquely, in time the curtain edges will grow right. When the lights go on at four, at the end of another year, a strong unhindered moon, the strength and pain of being young. I find myself breathless, my chest heaving when I finish reading his works. That's got to say something, hasn't it? I walked in the morning and in the afternoon too, first around the wooded foot of some local hills, along paths that were very muddy because the sun was bringing out the frost, and then round the villages this afternoon looking at the graveyards and the different houses, all quiet on a Sunday afternoon. You can remember days like this, when everything far or near at hand seemed specially graced by the light. Sheep, railway engines, yards, lanes, distant hills, iron gates, drinking pumps. It makes me glad to be alive and sets my head humming with all sorts of schemes that will live as long as a gnat. The privilege of being able to walk about on a day like this makes nonsense temporarily of all one's hopes and fears. I don't know about you, but whenever I'm asked what my favourite television programme of all time is, I lie for some reason. Until now, that is. Now I'm going to tell you the truth. My favourite television programme of all time is Mr Ben. More than any of the impressive and worthy answers I could have given, it provides a blueprint for my whole life, all the rummaging around junk shops and charity shops that I've spent my life doing. 
that sense of the unpredictable that those places engender. Just think about it, the orange changing room, the sense of the 60s, that red suit of armour in the front window, the shopkeeper appearing and disappearing as if by magic, the children throwing their arms up and down as he returns to Festive Road with his souvenir, that doo-doo lived next door, the grass being greener on the other side of the fence, all of that. Wellington has 13 charity shops in practically one street. It's one of the reasons I keep coming back here. Did I spoil it with that little dance I just did? Uh, no. Because Curiosity Killed the Cat straight back down to earth was, was playing, you see. And it always kind of gets me, gets me moving. I knew that's what it would be. Yeah, yeah. you see. By the, uh, by the rhythm of the moves, I thought that's got to be a Ben Vol Perrier Perio composition. That was composition. his name. I would have mentioned him if I could remember his name, the guy with the beret. The other guy, the bass player, a girl I knew once moved to London and sent me a postcard with a picture of him stuck to the back and it said, this man looks like you, right back to me or I'll fizz up and bust. <laughs> Park Street, the old main road into town. Beautiful cottages, yellow roses, numbered doorways, peeling paint, and all the houses squeezing and huddling together like they're trying to fit into a wide angle lens or a fisheye mirror. Lovely stuff. While some towns swell and spill and become continuous with their neighbours, other towns, like Wellington and like the town that I'm from, recede behind their ring roads, leaving little pockets of townness in their wake. This particular little pocket isn't bad. In fact, it incorporates what is probably the world's only manse, Sunday school, Methodist chapel and toy factory continuation. Not just any toy factory either, Chad Valley nonetheless home of Sooty, Sweep and Sue, and birthplace therein. Not bad for a little pocket of town, lapped by the waves of municipal progress. He was the chief attraction and the lion of the hour. The great men clustered around him. One of the most venerated names in English art took him by both hands and said, you have done with ease what I have striven all my life in vain to do. Another scarcely less eminent cried out, where have you been hiding all these years to be burst upon us now?
I like it up here. The hiss of the motorway below, first few drops of rain and a sea of summer corn and nestling in the distance as it always was, Wellington under the reeking.